Great to be with you. I want to welcome those who are watching online as we are continuing our teaching series, Church to the Max. And what we're going to be doing these next few weeks is we're going to be looking at the importance and the pivotal role that belonging to a church can have in your life. And so I'm so excited that you're here with us and I want to invite you to take out your teaching outline so you can follow right along over these next few minutes together as we journey through this important teaching. Now, last week we talked about preparing our hearts for these next couple of weeks and how we want to be on the same page as God and how that is important for every area of your life, that you are on point with God, you're on the same page as Him, so you can move forward because yes, indeed, God does want to bless us. He does want to put his hand of approval on our life and who we are, it's vital that we're on the same page as him. Now, part of being on the same page as God is knowing that church is not just an addendum or an add-on or just something we get around to, that God specifically designed the church for you and I. He specifically designed the church for a place for you and I to come Not only that we would just occasionally uh, come for a ceremony or some type of family event that it takes place before the, the big dinner or the big meal happens at the restaurant or the banquet hall or the catering hall, that we, we come here for this little event once a year or whenever somebody celebrates something. But church is so much more than an ornament or just a place to skip in and skip out every now and then that God designed the church for a very specific reason. Over these next couple of weeks, we want to tell you about that. Because it's vital to your walk with God that you're connected to a church. And when you're connected to God and connected to a church, there are certain benefits you need to know up front about that. First of all, there is something that you can't find on the face of the earth anywhere. I don't care how how hard you try and look. You're going to find God's peace when you're connected to Him. And we need that, especially in these times. You're going to find grace. Now, you can't find that anywhere. Every human being, including yourself, no matter how great you are, you're conditional, and so am I. God is unconditional, and His grace is unmerited, and that is found completely, exclusively in His cross, and that message is put forth by His church. And so peace, grace, and of course God's never-ending love. You know, the beautiful thing about God is He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And although things change, even different religions that are out there, You know, with new leaders of these heads of different religious organizations, they might change certain beliefs they have. You know what I'm thankful for? God doesn't change. I'm thankful for that. Actually, it says this about God's words. It says, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of God stands forever. And so when you put all of this together, it's much more than a religion. It's much more than just a check-in and check-out or a holiday faith or, you know, this is what I am, so I might as well go. God has so much more in store for church in your life. And I want you as your pastor or if you're a guest here today, I want you to know this because this can be a tremendous blessing in your life and you want to maximize the potential that God has for church in your life. And so there are different examples that God gives to describe church in the Bible. And I want to share all of them with you and focus on one of them this morning, and then we'll go through the rest of them each week in this message series. And I'll work my way backwards if you don't mind. As you study the scriptures, it's clear to see that God designed the church to be a classroom. And that's a good thing. That, you know, you think about school just started. You know, and Joseph just started kindergarten, and, and I was more nervous than him letting him go for the full day. I tell you, I didn't want to leave. And I kept looking in the glass door because they get to let him go in the cafeteria, and they got to take him over to their room. And man, I tell you, I almost had a heart attack. And some of you parents know that. And he's fine, you know. He's going to be one of those kids that when he hits a certain age, he's going to go to college out of state, and I'll just see him, you know, on the holidays or something like that, you know, or let me know he's getting married or something, or he got a job somewhere. But, you know, the parent, you know, you're like, your heart's beating a mile a minute. But in that classroom, we had to go for a meeting, and they had a curriculum meeting, and the 
teacher told us about the curriculum that they were going to teach. And then parents and grandparents or guardians had the opportunity to ask questions about, hey, how's the day going to go? And what's the schedule going to be like this? And so, you know, some of these parents, uh, for those of us who this was their first child going, you know, you had a million questions to ask. And, you know, bless that teacher's heart for staying after and ask, uh, answering all of those. But at the end of the day, it's important that, you know, you know your child is going there. This is the classroom they're in. And ultimately, you, they're there so they can learn and they could be equipped to go to the next grade. And that's a good thing. Now, if I walked in there and it was just a ropper room, there was toys, it was a complete mess, total confusion. And imagine this, um, hi, yeah, Mrs. O'Donnell, what are the, what are the kids going to learn this year? I don't know. I, don't, I was just going to put Sesame Street on for them all day. What do you think, Ray? I probably would have took them out of the school at that point. It's important that the classroom is a place of learning so that the next level could be achieved. And the church, in similar fashion, is God's classroom for you and I. You know, there are, there are so many tests that we have to pass on a daily basis in life. Life tests, integrity tests, okay? Being a faithful husband, being a faithful wife, uh, being faithful on your job. You know, lots of people want to talk about, oh, I, I'm, I'm a this type of Christian, I'm a that type of Christian, but they treat people like garbage. They got to get back in the classroom more. Maybe they got to sit a little closer, <laughs> Uh, maybe they got to open their ears a little bit more. I mean, let, let's be honest. The church is a classroom because we need it to be. We need to learn as much as we can. You never arrive. I actually get very concerned when somebody thinks they've arrived. Because we know the scripture says, pride cometh before the fall. And I don't care if you heard the same verse 150 times. If you got the joy of the Lord and you got the joy of the cross in your heart, it, it should mean something to you. Let me tell you something. When I see our flag, and I, listen, I'm not talking about politics or anything like that, but when I think of the men and women that have preserved our freedom and our right to worship, let me tell you something. I'm thankful for that. Amen. And I'm thankful for the people in our church that serve our country. I'm thankful for that soldier. Uh, they just had his funeral, came down New York Lane the, the last couple of days. And you know what? I'm thankful for our flag. And I'll be donned if I'm ever going to begrudge the freedoms that we have. And I would be sadly mistaken if I ever begrudged the freedom I have in Christ for the sacrifice he gave on the cross. He loves the church. He's the head of the church. He died for the church. He's going to come back for the church. And it's important that the church, when the church gets together and we're in his classroom, our hearts are open our ears are open and our hearts are open. Not just for information's sake, but for transformation's sake. The church is a classroom. We're going to talk about that in a few weeks. The church is the body. You heard the Apostle Paul, St. Paul talked about that. The body of Christ. You've heard that saying before. And every part of the body is important. And we're going to talk about that in a few weeks. You do not want to miss that message. I promise you I will have a live prop on stage of a body. Uh, and I thank God. Uh, one of the teachers in our church who will remain nameless so you don't ask him to borrow it. And then next week we're going to talk about how the church is a gym. God has designed the church for a place for you to come, for you to build some spiritual muscle because you need legitimate strength facing the trials and tribulations of this day. You don't need more money, although I would love to have more money because I was just looking at some of my debts I got to pay off. I would love to have more money and that would be great. But you know what? I'd find a way to spend it and I'd find a way to get myself a more, a more mess. You know, I'd love to have, uh, you know, more time in the day, but I'll find a way to waste that. I need more of God's strength in my life. I need abundantly. And God's church is a gym to help us develop some legitimate spiritual muscle. Not to puff you up and think you're this and that, and I'm, oh, just because I had a little tingle on my arm, I'm spiritual. No, to give you legitimate confidence in the resurrected Jesus Christ. And that's the church is a gym. And today I want to talk with you about a very foundational understanding of the church, it's crystal clear that this is how God feels. And you need to know that God wants you to be a part of that. And I'm very thankful for this. The church is not a business. The church is not an organization. The church is a family. That's what God designed it to be. And he wants you to be a part of his family. You might say, me, yes, you. Now, when you think about church, what's the common reaction to church? And you'll notice this. This is already written down for you in your outline. So you don't have to bother writing it down. But just take notice of this. The common reaction to church 
is isolation. You know what? I don't need that. Or if I go, I don't want to get too involved. I don't want to get crazy with it. I don't want to be known as a holy roller. And I think the definition of a holy roller is somebody that just comes and gets and never does anything. You get so fat, we roll you up and down the aisles. That's a holy roller. A holy roller is not being committed and coming to church. That's a good thing. So the common reaction is I'm going to isolate myself or I'm going to isolate myself. I know it all. I've been, I've been a Christian for this long and I know this and I know that. And that's a form of isolation. That's a common reaction. Welcome to the club. I've had it. You've had it. Let's be honest. But the command response of Christ is insulation. We're to insulate ourselves with the things of God, with the family of God. You know, again, it would be troubling to a parent if they had, say, three kids and two kids ate dinner with them every night. And the other kid slammed his door shut and put three locks on it. Never came out. That would be troubling to a parent. And it's troubling to God if his children don't sup with him when they're asked to come. When the time is to eat. When the time is to fellowship and have fun. It would break a parent's heart if the family was willing to pay for everybody to go on vacation. But then one kid said, you know what, I want nothing to do. I don't want to come or nothing. It would be tough for the family to enjoy the trip. Because they want that other family member there. It's vital. And it's vital to the heart of God. You know, you might not understand it this way, but allow me to give you proper understanding from God's word. True worship is doing the will of God. And when you go to church, you put a smile on the face of God. You put a smile on the face of God. That is an act of worship right there and then being connected. So God wants you to insulate it. Now, when we talk about connection, how do people think connection to church, what is it based on? And you have your outline here, and you'll, see, you'll notice the first one. Connection in church is based on what you have. Do me a favor, just so you know you're in the right church. Put a line through that, because that's incorrect. That is not what bases your connection in church. Put a line through that. But that's typically what people think. It's what you have. You know, church is like anything else. It's a battle of the have and the have-nots. And so if you have, you know what? You get a prime seat. You get a prime spot. And you're now good enough to be connected to God. And we see this. Religion does this all the time. They nickel and dime people for sacraments for crying out loud. I heard one person was telling me about a, a, a donation or it's not a, when somebody gives a suggested donation, I don't know any longer if it's considered donation any longer. It's more of a solicited donation. And for marriages or for funerals or all these types of things. You know, we've had a policy at our church for years and it'll always be as long as I draw breath. Okay? We will never take a dollar from a family when they bury somebody. We don't go there to do that. That's ridiculous. A lot of times, uh, you know, if a family wants to make a donation on their own, that's their business. But they will never be solicited. And usually a funeral pal will come up to me and go, well, uh, th- this is uh, what the, what's in the bill, you know, for you to do it. No, no, give that back to the family in their time of need. And the thing is, is because we've conditioned in our culture people to think church is about what you have so you can get to the next level spiritually. You can't buy heaven and you can't buy spiritual maturity. And you can't buy a seat in the church no matter how hard you try. I tell you, I went to a church one time where somebody had their name on the urinal. That's going overboard right there, okay? That's you going overboard at that point, okay? You want to name a gymnasium, whatever. But now a urinal, give me a break. It's not about what you have, so put a line through that. It's not about where you've been. And let's look at this in two ways. First, it's very easy sometimes to come to a church and think, well, I've been here and I've done this and I've done that, so let me tell you. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way in a family. Because what that could lead to is complaining. And what was one of our message points last week? This is something you need to write on the house somewhere. Let your contributions far outweigh your complaints in life. That's a good strategy for marriage, for any relationship, especially your relationship with church and God. And so it's not about where you've been. Praise God for where you've been. Uh, Don't let that be a soapbox. Let that be an opportunity to lend experience and help bring things along if they need to get somewhere. Because guess what? As we said last week, there's no such thing as a perfect church. There's no church on the face of the planet and their name is Perfect Community Church. No, no such thing. No such thing. So it's not about where you've been. And now look at the other side. It's not about where you've been if you've been a, a louse, for lack of a better terms. You haven't been the most honorable individual. And you might think, oh boy, I have no shot at getting connected here. Oh boy, wait till they find out who I am. Wait till they see this and wait till they see that. And I just want to share that with you today. That is not God talking. That's your own self-doubt. 
That's a wrong perception, and that is not the Word of God. Church is a place, God's home, the cross is a place of new beginnings. It's never a place to condemn. And that's one thing you need to know if you're new here, and maybe this is your first or second message uh, that you've heard. Uh, we're going to tell you like it is because we love you. But we're not going to tell you like it is to beat you over the head. We're going to do something even better than that. We're going to tell you how it could be in Christ. That's much better. And we're not going to condemn anybody because we know none of us are perfect. We're all sinners. We all fall short of God's glory. However, because we love you, we want to share with you the path that God has for you because we want his endorsement on your life. And if we didn't do that, then run and go to another place because this is not really a church. It's really just like a club or something like that. And we're just hanging out. We don't want to waste your time and we don't want to dishonor God. So no matter where you've been, we want to help you and you could connect. So put a line through that. It's not about where you've been. That doesn't ha that's not how you connect a church. It doesn't determine it. But circle this one right here. It's what steps you're taking. That's what it's all about. Your spiritual life could be summed up that way. What steps am I taking or lack thereof? What steps am I taking or what steps aren't I taking? You're as close to God. Now, now listen to this right now. You're as close to God as you want to be. You can't blame Tom, Dick, and Harry. You, you can't blame Susie and Larry and this one and that. You gotta, gotta look in the mirror. And just like anything in life, you gotta realize your worst enemy is the person that you look at in the mirror. And we know the enemy likes to pull on the heartstrings and play with our weaknesses. I know all about that. But we also need to be accountable before God. And we're as close to God as we want to be. And if you want to be close to God, you got to take legitimate steps. And church is a family. And God wants you to step into his family. He doesn't want you to just be an occasional every now and then. -er. He doesn't want you to just be, as I said before, a CEO Christian Christmas Easter only. And then a few Sundays in between. He wants so much more for you because he loves you. Because he wants you to be a part of his family. And he wants you to take the right steps to do that. And what I'd like to share with you this morning are three steps that are found in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 40 down to verse 47. And what's interesting about this particular place that I'm taking you to, this, this important real estate in the scripture, is this is about the first church, the church of Jerusalem. And if you're new to the Bible or you have a lot of experience, there's something that everybody needs to know. The church of Jerusalem is not a perfect church, but it's a church that we can look to and we could try to model ourselves after. Not, they didn't have any gimmicks. They didn't have any programs. They didn't put a thermometer on the wall for giving. And they didn't have a, a million and one things to go on the calendar. It wasn't bad. They were so busy. They were focused on the right things. They were taking the right steps. And I believe that these believers were being blessed both personally and corporately in the church because they were taking the right steps. And I want you to connect to church. And so that might be a question. How do I connect to church? How do I maximize my membership in a church? Well, let's look to the first church, the church of Jerusalem. Let's look at how God was using them. And I want to share with you these three steps. And if you don't mind, um, you'll notice in the scripture, in Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 40, allow me to read uh, these scriptures to you. It says, and with many other words, he, that means Peter, as we study the context of it, Peter stood up and gave the very first sermon after Christ rose from the dead. And he, that being Peter, bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Some of your translations may say perverse. In the Greek language, scolios means crooked or bent. Um, from this crooked, from this scolios generation, this perverse generation that's crazy, even back then, wet long before TV, society has always been a little bent, just so you know. Verse 41 says, so those who received his word, notice, were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls to the church. Amazing times here in the book of Acts. You have, at this point in history, you have an overwhelming population of somewhere around two to two and a half million people that are in the vicinity of the holy city. Why is that? Well, what just took place? The Passover events, the crucifixion, the resurrection, and guess what? People who, have, who saw Christ be crucified, and now he's risen from the dead. And you know what? John, the apostle John told us, you know, there's a lot of things that took place that if we, if we wrote them all, it would take the volumes of the world to hold it all. I bet you Jesus gave some pretty kicking sermons after he rose from the dead. 
He's the greatest object lesson of them all that he defeated death. And so there's no doubt in my mind and my heart that you have people who are here. You know what? They may have traveled for the Passover because that's what these Jewish believers did. But they said, you know what? Forget about the ranch at home. I'm staying right here where his apostles are. I saw him raised from the dead. I'm not going anywhere. And so you had this population swell here. And these folks are not just going to come and get their ears tickled. They're going to connect to Christ. Let me also give you a cultural backdrop here. Intense persecution for following Christ. Again, the one that they're professing faith in, he was just crucified. It wasn't exactly popular to follow Christ. And we see that throughout the book of Acts. That's why it's called the book of Acts, because they were getting busy. They were active in their faith. And Dr. Luke, you need to know this. If you're new to the scripture, you go, oh boy, who wrote this book? Let me tell you who wrote this book. The most educated writer in all the New Testament. Dr. Luke, who was also a historian. And I think that's very important to understand. Luke uses more Greek words in his gospel than all of the other writers do. Luke, the great physician. Luke, the historian. Who better than to historically give us a chronological account of what took place in the early church and thereafter than Luke. And so I thank God for Dr. Luke giving us this historical record and as you study history, as you get deeper in the book of Acts, you see a lot of cross-references with things you can read in your history books about world leaders. And so Luke records that Peter stood up and it says he bore witness and he continued to exhort them. And so what Peter did was, you know, I guarantee you Peter's sermon was a lot longer than what you could read. Who knows how long it was? An hour? Two hours? I don't know what it was. But it says he, he actually continued to exhort them, which means maybe there were some questions. And Peter then was giving personal testimony. What do you think his personal testimony was? I bet you it was this. Hey, guess what? I denied him three times. And when he rose from the dead, he made a house visit. And he sat with me and he had breakfast with me. And he forgave me. Peter knew something because he would once, eventually his head would be required of him for his faith. Peter was all about Christ. Peter who eventually would get it after he denied Christ. He made eye contact with him three times. He denied him. The third time he makes eye contact with him. He's humbled at that point. Prior to all of this, you remember Jesus said that I've prayed for you because Satan's going to sift you like wheat. But I pray that your faith won't fail you. And it didn't. Now, not his own faith because he's, he's Peter the Rock. Because there's a greater faith than your own faith, and that's your faith in Christ. Not yourself. A lot of teachings today teach you to have faith in yourself. You ever hear people say that? Well, so-and-so died. If they only would have prayed a little bit more. Oh, thank you, stupid. We didn't know that. You ever hear somebody say, that's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. It's, it's, it's crazy theology to think that way. Peter's not advocating a faith in your own ability to have faith, as some like to teach today still. Peter's teaching them about his faith in Jesus Christ. The one who paid for his sins in full. The one who met with him personally. We don't even have a record of that. You know why? Because it's personal. It's personal with God. We don't got to make a dog and pony show of it. And God may want to work on your heart today. Maybe you need to meet with Jesus personally in your heart. And after service, if you want to come up and tell somebody about it, or maybe you need to hear more about Jesus Christ, we're going to have counselors up here. You could do that. But Peter bore witness. And he says, save yourself from this crooked generation. We told you before, scolius. It means it's crooked. And so, they received his word. They received what he said earlier, which he said that you got to repent and you got to believe in Jesus Christ. They received that. The next step after you believe is what? Baptism. They, they had a party. You got baptized. We have a baptism coming up next month. If you haven't been baptized, we'd love for you to, to jump in and join in. And they were baptized. And they received his word. And that day, 3,000 souls were aired. So I want you to write this first connection step down. How did these people get connected to the church? Well, it's the number one way to be connected and to be a member of God's church. First step of connection, we're talking about connection, so you've got to tie it to something. Tie your commitments to God's Son. Tie your commitments to God's Son in this life. Make it all about Jesus Christ. Tie your commitments to Him. And that goes, that's not just on the front end. Even if you're an experienced believer, a good question that one of my mentors shared with me many years ago, is you always got to ask yourself, is it about Jesus Christ? 
That needs to be that we sang it earlier in case you missed it. That, that might be the only song we ever need to sing. It's all about him. It needs to revolve about, around him. When it comes to that, it's a, it's a theocracy. It's all about Christ. It's not about man. It's not about a board or anything. It's about Jesus Christ. And you know what? The early church made it about Christ and God did amazing things. He added, which un gives us the understanding of his blessing, his endorsement. And my friends, in similar ways, God wants to add to your life if you are willing to tie yourself to Christ. Only if you're willing though. He's a king. He's not a beggar. Nobody's begging you. Nobody's twisting your arm. None of our muscle uh, security is going to hold you up by your feet and say, you got to tie yourself to Jesus. Nobody's going to tell you to do that. You can leave after service. Nobody's going to bother you. I pray God bothers you. He convicts you. Because you become what you're committed to. And you want to tie your commitments to Jesus Christ. On the front end of your life, maybe you need to untie your, your boat. You're tying yourself to things that are, that are sinking you to hell. Let's just be blunt. There's a heaven and there's a hell. This is not hell. Trust me, it's not. You don't want to go to hell. And guess what? You don't have to go to hell. Jesus Christ died on the cross and he rose from the dead on the third day. We are forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. And we believe in him not only for forgiveness of sins, but we, forget, we believe in him for life after death. And nobody's offering that because nobody can. There's only one empty tomb and that's in Jerusalem. My friends... You want to tie yourself to Christ if you never have before. You need to do that. Now, even though you may have loosened your rope and you've gone your own way, guess who has never taken his rope off of you if you believe in Jesus Christ, God? You can never lose his commitment. Now, we break commitments all the time, right? Have you ever made, oh, God, if you get me through this, I will do, but, 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 like a machine gun, you know? We make a hundred promises to him. And we break all of them by the end of the day, it seems like. Oh boy, oh God, if, how many times, and, you, and some of you got to be honest, now how many times have you played the lotto? Okay. <laughs> Listen, you're going to lose anyway, don't do it. G just give it to the Lord. Every, every time play, oh God, if I can just hit the mega million, I will give this and that and this and that. And we would all love to do that. But you know what? Don't worry about hitting the mega million. Don't worry about that. Tie yourself to Christ in all that you do. Husbands, tie yourself to Christ to be the man that God wants you to be in your home. Ladies, tie yourself to Christ in your home. If you're single, tie yourself to whoever you are. If you're, if you're young right now and you're going, well, I can't believe my parents dragged me in here, or maybe you want to be here. Thank God that you're hearing this now because your parents will tell you, man, I wish I could have heard this stuff when I was your age. That's the best thing your parents could give you is the opportunity to follow Christ. Forget about money and the cars and all that other stuff. Is, a, is, is Christ. And if you could tie your life to Christ now at this age, how strong will you be 10 years from now? 20 years from now? Forget about what everybody else is doing. Everybody else is not going to care about you from now. But your parents who sit next to you do. And the best thing, though, all they want you is to tie your life to Christ, to God's Son. Now, these areas of commitment, let me run through them quickly because I'm, I'm, I'm having too much fun with this first message. Okay? And we, I have a membership class to teach after this. I got to get going here. Okay? Uh, I just have, I'm having a lot of fun because I love the church. I, I, I love this church and I love, I'm having too much fun up here. So I got to keep going. I'm sorry. Areas of commitment, belief. They believed and how they believed was they had to repent. That's what Peter told them. If you look earlier, repent. And repent's not a bad word. Repent is not a band-aid on a wound. Repent is the surgery you need if you're bleeding out. Because repentance in Greek means metanoia. It means to understand and go in a different direction. It's a beautiful thing. And you want to have a repentance to Christ. It will bless your life and your heart. And they repented before God. That was their belief. Secondly, they belonged. They became active members of this church as you read the passage. They didn't just, oh, I repent. I got my hell insurance and the hell with everybody else. No, they didn't do that. They didn't watch church on TV. Well, they didn't have it, but they wouldn't have if they did. They wanted to be in the mix. And then behavioral. They obeyed. They got baptized. They, they started to give. They started to serve. They started to help the other people who were not from that area. They started to bless them and help them. They tied their lives to Christ. And I have this little uh, thing I have written down here. It says these three commitments become the daily checkpoints 
for maintaining a vibrant connection to God and his will. If you ever are struggling, and we all struggle, just do this little check thing here. God, how's my belief right now? Do I need to give anything? I need to repent anything. God, how's my membership right now? Am I being active? Am I serving? Because that's part of your plan. Because the church is a family. It's not a business. It's not a lemonade stand or a hot dog stand. It's a family. And then how's my behavior right now, God? Am I honoring you? Am I, am I disobeying you in any way, God? I want to bring honor to you. My friends, these three become the checkpoints for maintaining a vibrant connection to God. Write this second step down as we move along this morning. The rate I'm going this evening. The third point might be at 10 o'clock here. <laughs> I hear the Manning Bowl is at 4.30, so I've got to put it in gear. The second step of connection is tie my convictions, your convictions. So he said, tie my commitments to God's son. Secondly, tie my convictions to God's word. Tie your convictions to God's word. Don't tie it to YouTube. Don't tie it to a, a denomination or, a, or a, another church's beliefs or anything like that. Tie your convictions to God's holy word. God's promises are the substance for your life and your growth in Jesus Christ. That's how God set it up. In fact, Jesus said that I'm going to sanctify them by the Spirit and the Word. That's how it comes together. God's Word becomes so important. Now, I'm not just saying that. That's what the early church did. Look what it says here in verse 42, the first part of it. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They were all about the teaching that the apostles were sharing. Now, where were the apostles getting it from? They got it from Jesus. Jesus had just commissioned them to go and teach all that I've commanded to you. So the substance for church is the word of God. The substance for how people believe is the word of God. The apostle Paul told us that. Faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of God. So the Bible becomes a very important part of your life. You know, one of the things that is so sad for me to hear sometimes when people come, they go, man, I went to church for years, and I, man, I never ever heard really the Bible taught. And that breaks my heart. We live on, Stat Staten Island is biblically illiterate. And I, let me tell you, I'm going to be honest with you. I say that with love and sincere because at one time I was biblically illiterate. We've all been there. It takes one to know one. And we're here to help each other. And since this is God's family, a fam family's got to help each other. Family sticks together. And family has to help one another know the promises of God and the truths of God so that we can be rooted up and built up in Christ. And so that strongholds could come tumbling down. So that characters can change. Integrity levels could raise. And we could put some of those old dogs to rest once and for all. Because by his word... We hear the beautiful promises that by his stripes we're healed. Hey, that's powerful right there. You're not going to find that in a fortune cookie. You're not going to find that on the internet. By his stripes you are healed. Whipped 40 plus times. Beaten. By the way of the cross. Right there and then. That piece of our faith is very powerful. Documented for us in the Gospels prophesied in the Old Testament. The apostles were teaching this. We've got to tie our convictions to God's word. Now, doing this further, how do you build this conviction daily in your life? First, you've got to have daily devotions. Oh, I already know that. Go to the next one. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. or Mrs. Perfect. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we, we didn't mean to waste your time. Praise God you could read your Bible. And somebody isn't knocking at your door to take your head off. Nobody's perfect with their devotional life. We could all improve. Hey, you're doing 15 minutes, add more time onto it. Daily devotions, vital to your conviction process of tying it to God's word. Consistent church attendance. I want to encourage you, as this is like a, a new year for the church and it's this series that we're doing. We have a membership class after the church service today, in between services. I want to encourage you to maximize your, your attendance. Over time, it will grow your knowledge of God's word. But again, not just knowledge, it'll grow God's hand of transformation in your life. The, the, one of the be most beautiful things that people tell me, it, listen, people, you, you are very gracious to me. You've always been, and I thank you. I, there's no other church I'd rather be at than this church. This is the only church I ever want to pastor. I'm very blessed here. 
and people are very kind after the service to say things, okay? And, and, and you keep it real sometimes, which I appreciate. But the most beautiful thing that I hear is when people will tell me how they're putting God's word into practice from what they're hearing, whether it be the men's group, the ladies' group, the church, the sermon. And that blesses my heart like you wouldn't believe. And I'm thinking if that blesses my heart and I'm a human being who's as stupid as that person who needs God's grace, what does that do for the holy heart of God? Be consistent with your church attendance. God will help you in your life as you are faithful to his family. Small group Bible study. As the church offers men groups, lady groups, specialty Bible studies, home groups. You're not going to make everyone. This, this is not 1940. This is not your grandmother's church. We understand that. Both people work in homes now. Some of you work two and three jobs and mortgage. I mean, we understand that. You're not going to make every single thing. Connect to something here so that we can help give you a coverage. So you can have pastoral coverage if you're connected. We know what's going on in your life. So we can pray for you. So your small group could love you in times of crisis. Tie your convictions to God's word. And then write this final step down as we march towards the close. This third step of connection. Tie my contributions to God's work. Can you say God's work with me together? God's work. You want to be about God's work, God's business. Listen, you don't got to raise your hand because we're not here to embarrass anybody because we could all raise our hand. And maybe we could just all agree to raise our hand in just a moment. But how many of us regret being about our business at one time or another in our life? Right? We wasted time being about our business. We got to be about God's business. We got to be about God's work. This early church, they were tied to Jesus Christ. They were tied to God's word. For some of them, they faced incredible persecution. Family turned their back on them. Later on, we know of riots and raids and poverty and famines. The church of Jerusalem suffered. That's why Paul had to tell the church of Corinth, we got to take a collection They've had an earthquake. They've had a famine. There's hundreds of thousands of believers in this area. But the early church did what they could because they were about God's work. They were about God's work. They, they, they weren't just about paying it forward or let me just do a good deed so I can get a, a good star on my shirt or get a good place close to the throne when I drop dead because that's why I'm doing this. It's all about me. No, it's not what it was about. They weren't doing anything for any patron saint. They weren't doing anything to get their name somewhere in the building. They were doing it because it, they were all about God's work. And when God's people are corporately about God's work, he does great and amazing things. When you are about God's work personally in your life, just as this church was blessed, as I said earlier, and I cannot say it enough this morning, God wants to bless you in your life. And I'm not talking about boats and cars and yachts and all that stuff. Forget about that stuff. I'm talking about how God is going to bless you internally in your life as you become about his work. Stop being about your work because your work is leading you to hell in a handbasket or it's leading you away from the, the cross and that which God purchased for you. You're like this multi-million dollar trust fund child who's begging in the street for coins. Your father owns a cattle on a thousand hills. Your father wants to bless you. And you're settling for the crumbs of this world. You want to tie it to God's work, my friends. Let me run through this quickly. And you'll notice underneath how the early church contributed. I'll go through it. And the fellowship. The word fellowship in Greek is koinonia. Sharing. Partnership. They were a part of the church. They weren't just name only. It wasn't a club. They, had, they were getting their hands busy. And we're going to see how they did that. They were breaking bread. Now that's, that's communion. They were focused on the cross and on the resurrection. Jesus told them to celebrate it. They were. They were breaking bread. I, I, I'm going to tell you right now. We need to do it more in our church. And we will. We did it last week. It's going to be coming up again. There's something that's sobering about communion. Had nothing to do with the elements. Has everything to do with the message of communion. 
They were focused. Second, thirdly, they were praying. Now, it's interesting. There are numerous Greek words for prayer in the scriptures. This word is pros ekenu. And this is speaking of intense, earnest prayer. There's other words like ekenu or ekenumai, which is a, you know, a petition prayer. Or, you know, kind of start your day off and God just bless me and help me not to get a ticket from these uh, communist cameras that are up on the bus post, on the bus lane or something. Well, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm venting. I'm sorry about that. I, I apologize. I apologize about that. But, you know, it's just that type of prayer. No, this is earnest prayer. This is, you know, throw it down to the mat prayer. And God's people need to do that. My friends, I want to challenge you. When the church has prayer, come. Pray for your loved ones. Pray for the community. Just come and pray and seek the heart of God. We got one coming up at the end of September. Come and pray. Let, let's pray together. Come early to the service. After the service, if you need to lay a prayer request down with the, with, the, with the pastoral counselors, prayer is powerful. The Bible says the prayer of the righteous prevaileth much. Prayer is vital. If the Son of God could pray, then the people of God could pray. And God's people, my friends, this, Jesus actually said, do you remember Jesus flipped over the tables of the money changers? On his way to the cross, that's the first thing he did after he got off the donkey, by the way. He didn't go to Dunkin' Donuts. He went to the temple, and he cleaned the temple out. They were hoodwinking people over three times the currency. Jesus flipped the tables up, and what did he say? My house shall be a house of bingo. Did he say my house shall be a house of fundraising? That my house shall be a house of everybody acts like a lunatic in a circus? No, my house shall be a house of prayer. It's a house of prayer because... The church is a hospital, and there are people who have legitimate needs, and God has legitimate answers and legitimate peace to help people through. They were praying. They were generous. We're told that as they were in awe over the signs and wonders that were going on, no doubt the apostles were given the, the special blessing to bring healing and restoration as Jesus did. It says this, that they were in awe, and then they were, they were selling possessions. Nobody told them to do this, by the way. There was no program. And they were giving willingly. They gave willingly. They were generous. Imagine that, Christians who were generous. They were giving to one another. Because people had need. Evangelism. It says they went to the temple. Now, these were... Many Jewish believers going to the temple. What are they going to the temple for? To share their faith. To witness. To share the message of Jesus Christ. My friends, do not be bashful. But always be prepared, Peter tells us, to give an answer for the hope that is within you. There are people that need this message. And don't stop praying for a loved one or a friend or anybody else who you know needs Jesus Christ. And then hospitality. They open their home to one another. Now, some of you say, you know, Ray, you really use the illustrations of food a lot in the scripture, uh, in your sermons. Well, I'm going to tell you, I'm just being biblical. It says they went from house to house. They were breaking bread. But the scripture translates and tells us they were eating food. So it, it demonstrates that they had communion. But guess what? They were also eating. It goes on to say that they had a simplicity of heart. That word simplicity speaks of a steady stream with no interruption. They had this steady stream of fellowship because they were connected to the right things. God's son, God's word, and God's work. I close by sharing something important with you that is connected to God's work. As we sit today, and what a blessing it is to be here in America, our brothers and sisters in Syria are on the run who believe in Jesus Christ. Reports have come through that are documented through uh, legitimate sources that the Arab Spring and their goons have captured women, raped them, beheaded children, men and women, and have put out a word for folks to renounce their faith in Christ. God's work, God's work is much more, much more than you and I getting what we want. My friends, pray for our brothers and sisters there. I look forward to meeting those who would not renounce Christ. I look forward to meeting those who had everything tied to Jesus Christ. And we need to pray for God's intervention. God has always blessed the church in the face of persecution. 
When Paul wrote Romans chapter 8, you know that verse that everybody quotes left and right. Well, God works all things together. He wrote that to Christians who are going to be fed to lions. When Jeremiah said, I know the plans the Lord has for you. Plans for you to prosper. That's not just a Hallmark card. Jeremiah knew that the city was going to be besieged. And people were going to lose their lives. Anytime you look at scripture. And you look at these promises. They're much more than a pick me up. They look far beyond the circumstances of this world. And they look to the world to come. Heaven for the believer. And I want to encourage you as we close today about connecting to church. I want you to connect your contributions to God's work because there's much more than this. Our contributions to give financially go to advance God's work locally and globally. And we need to be about that. We need to be about God's work because guess what? You can't take it with you. No matter how hard you try. Your encouragement to serve in the church to be an usher, to be a greeter, to serve in any capacity is not just to propagate a program. It's because we fundamentally believe there's no greater work to be a part of other than the work of God. And we believe, we don't just think it's just some hood ornament of the faith. We believe in a resurrected Jesus Christ. And we believe he's the hope of the world. And God has called us in this local assembly of believers to be connected so that we could experience life change so that we can demonstrate that life change to a lost and dying world. My friends, there is no greater connection than your connection to Jesus Christ and your connection to God's family, the church. I can go on and on and on about this. But I'm going to close it here by just sharing two simple things with you. Maximize your relationship with Jesus Christ. Make it all about him. Tie it all to him. And connect to his church. Maybe you don't like this church. Maybe you don't like my hair. I don't know what it may be. <laughs> I'll set you up somewhere else. We didn't, we're not into numbers. Main thing is that you're in church and you're accountable to God and to other people. And you're not just waffling out there on the sidelines, but you're in the game. The real game. Where there are high stakes. God's work. And I want to make you a little promise that I'll collect on in heaven. There will be no regrets when you're about God's work. You will not get to heaven and go, would have, should have, could have, and didn't. You're going to be laying your crowns at the throne of God. That's what it's all about. So my friends, today I ask you, because I love you, untie your rope from whatever garbage that is leading you to hell and tie your rope to Christ. And if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, as I shared last week and I challenge you today, Join me in putting your hand to the plow. And let's let Christ's name be known on this island. Let's do amazing things together to love and help people together. And let's see God get all the glory. If you believe that, say amen. amen. Bow with me for a word of prayer. Our Father and our God... We thank you that there is no other name by which men could be saved other than the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for this first church of Jerusalem that heeded to Peter's words and they tied themselves to you, to your son, to his forgiveness, to his lordship. Lord, let that be said of us today. Lord, I pray today, even after the service, that the, the altar would be filled with people who come up to the prayer counselors and just ask for your endorsement on their life, prayer, or come to want to know about how they can tie themselves to you. 
Lord, we pray for our church here, God. We pray for all the Bible teaching churches on Staten Island. We pray for all of those who have their hands to the plow. Every pastor, every staffer, every volunteer on Staten Island in the greatest city of New York. Well, there's no place like New York. It's so hard to do this work. We know the enemy has casted his cloud over this area. But in the name of Jesus, we stand on your promises. And we believe greater things are still to be done here. Greater things are still to be done on this lane. Greater things are still to be done in the hearts and lives of the people that are sitting here. Lord, there are family members that they are praying for to come. I pray that you would bring a harvest in each person's life. I pray for the person who's praying for their child. I pray, God, that you would hear those prayers. And that you would bring uh, that prodigal back to you, God. That husband, Lord, for every woman that's here alone today, God, I pray you'd hear their prayer, God. Every man that doesn't have his wife here. Lord, every person who's brokenhearted over a loss or, or a struggle or a strain. Everybody who has an addiction, oh God. I pray that all of us would know the power of your word. The power of the cross and the empty tomb today. And we would connect today to you, to your church. Lord, we give this prayer before you today. Believing and trusting in you. And we show this commitment in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all of God's people said.